Morning, Kyle. Morning, Professor. How are you doing today? All right. How are you? Oh, not bad. I finally got my internet back in the house, so that's good. Uh, what happened? Uh, we're just out for a couple of days. I guess the uh, the they had an issue with our account. The modem didn't know what speed to operate at, so they had to reset it manually. And mm. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was on hotspot on Tuesday, but I didn't I didn't make it in time for for the lecture. So oh, okay. Well, I think I put it up, so <laughs> you can take a yeah. look at it. I have looked through all the slides, and I, I was uh, taking notes on chapter 19 in my book, so I have started a little bit at least. Looks like we're starting on colligative properties here. Uh, well, I think I, I, went through, I think I went through colligative, the actual background for it, but I haven't done any of the calculations yet. Is that right? I think that's, well, actually, you, know, you, you went there, so. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's all right. I mean, I remember a lot of that from last year. Which is yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I went through this part, and then I didn't get a, I didn't get a chance to start on the actual calculations. Coordination chemistry. Yes. All right, we'll get started here. Ah, dear. I'm not sure how I can improve attendance. You know, there's, I think, at least 35 people enrolled in this course and routinely I get less than, less than five people turning up to these Zoom sessions. Uh, I don't know. The better half, the better people. Yeah, I don't know. I'm wondering if I should stop recording them. I wonder if that would help, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, I always do the sessions right before the test, so I, yeah. at least I find them useful. No, okay. And somebody else said to me the other day, well, you know, sometimes, you know, you can watch these and you can skip the parts you already know. And I suppose that's true too, I guess. All right. So we've got these formulas here. I'm going to put formulas up. These are formulas you're actually given. You don't have to memorize any of these. These are given to you on the test. I'll show you this in a bit. All right, so we talked about these colligative properties. We've got the, this is a freezing point depression. We've got boiling point elevation. Here we've got uh, vapor pressure lowering. And this is osmotic pressure. All right, so we talked about these, these four the other day. Now you don't have to memorize any of these, they're actually given to you with the test. So the first one here, we're looking for the freezing point of the solution and we're given the freezing point of pure acetic acid. And we're also given this other value KF, which is called the molal freezing constant. And that's always given to you, it's a constant value. Now the M value is the molality. And I have 1.4 M recorded for that, but this was based on a previous calculation 
and it's this one here, molality of phenol, because this is what we're looking at. And the molality of phenol came out to be 1.4 M. So that's where I'm getting that, that 1.4 M from. I'm just making it up. In the ones you'll be doing on the test, I think you'll have to calculate it based on the data in the actual question. And then you'll be able to, to do this calculation here once you've got that concentration. Okay, so let's have a look at the, the way we do that. So delta TF is equal to KF M. Now the KF value is 3.90, now it's degrees Celsius per molal, where M is moles per kilogram. And that's multiplied by 1.4 moles per kilogram, which is the, the other way of expressing the little m here. So what we end up with is something in degrees Celsius. Now that 5.5 degrees Celsius is a delta, which is a change in temperature. So that's what delta means, it's a change. But we already know what kind of change it is because it's freezing point depression. So what that means is the new freezing point is going to be 16.6. That's what we were given as the pure freezing point. And it's important that we do minus 5.5 degrees Celsius. And the reason for that is because it is freezing point depression. That's why we put minus in here. So it could be 11.1 degrees Celsius, but a new boiling point. So by creating this solution, we've been able to lower the temperature of freezing by 5.5 degrees Celsius. Does anybody have any questions about the new freezing point calculation? So we can do something similar with the, the boiling point and we can say Delta TB equals KBM. So that's going to be a different value for the K value, but that's okay. Now the K value here is 3.07 degrees Celsius per molal. The molality is still the same at 1.4 M. And that comes out to be 4.3 degrees Celsius for the change. Again, it's a change that we're looking at here. It's changing boiling point with that delta there. And the new boiling point, because it's boiling point elevation, is going to be 118.0 degrees Celsius, not minus, but plus. And it's going to be plus 4.3 degrees Celsius, which comes out to be 122.3 degrees. No, so you notice that the freezing point goes down and the boiling point goes up. So I gave you some background about that the other day, but that's the that's that's what happens here with these problems. Does anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Okay. The the next one here has to do with the next one here has to do with. Um, change in vapor pressure. So the delta VP or I've got delta P solvent, which is really the same thing here. And it's a chi, chi solute and P naught solvent. It's probably just, it's just the opposite way around here. It's the same thing though. Now the P naught is the vapor pressure of the pure solvent and you, you are given that. The temperature is really not relevant to the problem, but the vapor pressure changes depending on the temperature. That's why the temperature is quoted because at high temperature, you have a higher vapor pressure, but the temperature here isn't used in the problem at all. It's not, it's not meant to be a trap or anything. It's just what we do. We, we always quote a vapor pressure at a temperature. The mole fraction of the solute is again, the result of a previous calculation and it's uh, this one here, where we've got the mole fraction of phenol 0 0.079. Now there's no unit on the mole fraction. 
and that's times 20.0 torr, which is the vapor pressure. So the change in vapor pressure is going to be 1.6 torr. Now it's vapor pressure lowering, and that's a, that's the key there. So the new vapor pressure, once we made up the solution, is going to be 20.0 torr, which is what it was initially, minus 1.6 torr, which comes out to be 18.4 torr on the new vapor pressure. Does anybody have any questions about the lower, lowering of vapor pressure? The minus here is important because it's due to vapor pressure lowering. Again, you can always go back and take a look at the background on that too. All right, last one is the osmotic pressure. And the 1.2 moles per litre, again, is the result of a, a calculation we did previously. And it was the molarity of phenol, which came out to be 1.2 big M. And that's times R. This is not a value you have to memorize. It's given to you. Uh, liters, atmospheres per mole per Kelvin. It's a unit from that. And then, of course, we need that temperature there in Kelvin as well. So that's be 298 K. Then once, it, once all said and done, we end up getting 29 atmospheres as our final answer. So that's for the, uh, that's for the, osmotic pressure. Does anybody have any questions about any of this? Okay, so let's take a look at the, take a look at this practice test here. And you'll be able to see the, the problems that relate to what we've talked about so far. So in the, this in the concentration section, you can see we've got the mass percent problem. We've got the molarity problem. We've got molality here as well, and then mole fraction down here. And then in the colligatives, the colligative property section, you'll notice you're given all of these different equations that we just talked about, as well as the R value. And for the freezing point of the solution, you, know, you are given the data that allows you to calculate the molality. So you'll have to do that first and then, then calculate the actual freezing point depression and then what the new freezing point would be. Do the same thing with the boiling point. Uh, likewise, for the vapor pressure, again, you'll need to calculate that mole fraction first. And then you will need to do the uh, molarity followed by the, uh, followed by the osmotic pressure. Now, what's important to note here in, in these problems, as I discussed the other day, when we were looking at concentrations, you can be given volumes or masses of solute. You'll only ever be given a volume or, or mass of, of, um, of solvent, but solvent will always be a liquid. So uh, do you, you have to take into account anything that, that goes along with that. Now, don't forget, I do have videos for all of these problems as well. So that will give you some guidance if you're not sure about how to, how to handle some of the, some of the nuts and bolts of these problems. Does anybody have any questions about what they're going to see on the practice test with regard to this? I don't think I need to tell you it's what you're going to see on the real test as well, right? But the idea would be to, to do these a number of times uh, to make sure that you understand exactly what you're doing because sometimes these quantities vary along with uh, the units. So you have to be aware of how to apply the density to get what you need. If you need a volume, 
from the density or a mass from the density. All right, does anybody have anything, anything at all about what they're saying here? So on the, um, on this practice test, the numbers or like the questions that relate to what we've gone over so far are 17, 18, 19. Well, it's everything under the concentrations, okay. Uh, okay. everything under the concentrations heading here. That's 17 through 20. And then, okay. collig then colligative properties, you can see that here. Okay. And that's uh, 21 through 24. Okay, so basically 17 to 24, got it. Yeah, no, but okay. it, it, it all has headings, Gabriella, so you know, it's, it's not really. Right, yeah. All right. <laughs> Uh, but you know the thing is, yes, I can I can go through all this, but in the end, it's it's going to be up to you to do the practice. And I don't mean you personally, Gabrielle. I mean everybody. Everybody has to do the practice to to really get a handle on on what they're doing. All I can do is just offer the guidance here. All right. Does anybody have anything else about concentration or colligative properties they're concerned about? All right. Nobody's saying nothing. Okay. Now, as part of the, this is not going to be an, an issue for the test, the Van Hoff factor, but it is an issue when we're talking about some of the problems that you're doing for extra credit in the concentration and colligative properties uh, uh, quizzes, the ones that are the ones that are in the test for Boulder. Now the Problems we've been dealing with so far all have a Van Hoff factor I of one. In other words, when we dissolve them in solution, they don't break apart. So the all of these here, if I equals one, you can see they just reduce to, to what I had said earlier, which is just these equations right here. However, if we're dealing with a compound, usually, well, always, I guess, an ionic compound, then ionic compounds will tend to break apart in water and that will increase the number of particles. So what I'm saying here is if you've got something like, the clue is look for aqueous here. And if you've got Na2CO3 aqueous, that would break apart into two Na pluses and one CO3 two minus. So the I value would be three, two plus one is three. AlCl3 would be one plus three, which is four and HBr would be one plus one, which is two. So that's how that, that's how the adjustment comes into play with the Van Hoff factor. And as I said, in the credit quiz or the practice quizzes for the concentration colligative properties, there are some problems that do require you to use the Van Hoff factor, but this is how you find it. Now, won't, there, there won't be any questions on the real test about this though. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, that's all I really wanted to do was just point that out to you so you, you knew where to find it. Okay, so I, on the other day, I, I went through what we would be doing as far as the, uh, the, the schedule here. And you know, today is Thursday, next, next week is, is Tuesday, there will be a class next Tuesday. But then Thanksgiving is the following Thursday, so we won't have class then. And then the test is due the following Tuesday. So, you know, you've got, uh, we'll, we'll do a, I'm going to do the coordination chemistry today, or at least a, a lot of it. I'll try and, I'll, I'll see what I can do about getting it finished. I think I probably can get the coordination chemistry finished today. And then that will leave uh, Tuesday, next Tuesday for a review of the test and uh, leave people with really no excuse for not actually doing the test. You know, at some point, maybe maybe towards the end of the Thanksgiving weekend, that might be a good time to do it. All right, coordination chemistry. What are we talking about? Well, coordination chemistry is the situation we have with metals and how metals bond to different groups. If you remember what about metals, metals are electropositive, meaning they do tend to accept electrons. Uh, when they bond. And uh, the idea is that they form what's called a coordinate bond. So let's uh, just take a look at what I mean by that. So 
But here's an example. If you have, say, cobalt, now we'll say cobalt to two plus, and we've got ammonia, which is NH3, with two electrons of the lone pair on the end. What happens is that those electrons can be used to bond to the metal, but you'll notice that you'll notice that both of the electrons from the body are going to form the bond are from the nitrogen. So we call this a coordinate or dative bond. So it's called a coordinate bond. We call the groups that attach to the metal ligands or ligands, depending on where you're from. And these are the ligands that we that we will talk about. We've got CN minus, NO2 minus, EN, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. NH3, H2O, OH minus, F minus, CL minus, BR minus, and I minus. You'll notice this is a you'll notice this is a a list of strong field down to weak field. And I'll tell you about the relevance of strong field and weak field in, in a little bit. But let's talk about the, the way that these are set up, at least as far as how they're expressed. Now you'll notice you've got CO and it's got all this stuff in these square brackets and then you've got some stuff on the outside. There's going to be two kinds of coordinate systems that we'll be dealing with. We're going to be dealing with octahedral and tetrahedral. So octahedral is a situation where you've got six things around the, the central element. And if you want to make them as far apart as possible, this is how you would do it. So if you've got CO here, and then there's five NH3s and one CN, that's a total of six objects around the CO. And if you've got octahedral, they're very, very basic setup is going to be something like this. So you'll have your four at 90 degrees here, and then you'll have these other two. And these are at, these are at 90 degrees as well, but they're going back into the page and out the front of the page here. If you've got five NH3s, now you'll notice because of what I was talking about up here with NH3, it's always the N that bonds into the central metal because that's where the electrons are. So you'll notice that's how I'm expressing the bonds as well to the nitrogens. Now with CN minus, I know that it's hard to tell, but the actual electrons are on the C here. So that would be CN. So that's in the square brackets. Now, the reason it sets itself up like this is because if you've got six objects around any central element, that's this is the shape it's going to take on because everything wants to be as far apart from everything else as it possibly can be. So all of these are 90 degrees. Is anybody having trouble visualizing the, the angles here, uh, what I mean by the octahedral? Maybe I'll, I'll, just, I'll just quickly go and go ahead and show you an octahedral shape so that you can visualize that a little bit more easily. Let's see if we can see something here. There we go. So that's what it looks like. Anybody have any questions about that? If you see these two here, the ones I'm pointing to with my cursor, can you see my cursor, by the way? You can, okay. So you can see this is the one that's pointing in. This would be the one that's pointing out. And these four here that I'm pointing to are the ones that are in the plane here, right? So this is the same thing, it should rotate a little bit. Is anybody having trouble with the visualization here? So we're not quite done with this yet. We do have two BRs on the outside as well. Now the BR is always going to have a negative one charge. 
and we can know this because you know we can see it here in the in the ligand list as well br negative so so you got two of that and what that means is that if those are two if those are two negative charges it means that everything in the square brackets has to be positive too and that means we can actually calculate the charge on the cobalt that's going to result here and it's going to be cobalt plus we do a little bit of algebra here plus five times zero, the charge on ammonia is zero, as you can see in the list here, there's no charge on it. And CN, as you can see, has a charge of negative one. So all of that adds up to positive two, which is the charge on the entire part in the square brackets, which means the cobalt would have a charge of plus three in this instance. So that's how we figure out the charge on the, the central on the central element, the central metal. We have to know though, the charge on what's on the outside too. So these are, these are coordinate compounds, but they're also ionic compounds too, by nature. Does anybody have any questions so far? So the kinds of questions you're going to see on the, on the test that relate to this, Actually, it's a lot easier for you than it is for the people who had to do this on pen and paper where they actually had to draw it. So, you know, these questions I ask are actually not too bad on the test once you see them. But they have to do with uh, these, these concepts. First of all, the concept of isomers. And then there'll be the concept of field strength and DD splitting. and how many unpaired electrons we have at the end. So that's, that's what we're going to, just going to focus on. Let's focus on the isomers first. And there's three kinds of isomers we're going to talk about. Now isomers, what are isomers? Isomers have the same formula, same molecular formula, but different structures. The first method that we can form an isomer of something would be via what I'm calling ion anion exchange. So what I'm saying here is that if you look in the, center of the square brackets or at least in part of the square brackets here you can look for a ligand that has a negative charge in this case it's cn nh3 doesn't have a negative charge but the cn could actually be exchanged with the br negative the cn negative can be exchanged with br negative and you can see that that's that's how we've done this done this here and that comes up with a different compound so now with the cobalt connected to the BR and the CN on the outside, that's actually different to what we had before. It's got the same molecular formula, but it's different. So that is, that's what I mean by exchanging anions. You can only exchange anions if you've got anions on the outside and that, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you've got cations here, so you can't do it then. The other thing is you need something with a negative charge connected to the central element too, in order to make this happen. Does anybody have any questions? The other type, another type of um, isomerism is called positional or geometric isomerism. And here is an example of that. This compound here is called uh, plat, well, it's called platin. This one is cisplatin. This one is called transplatin. You can see the difference here. It's a square planar structure. Let me see if I can. I'm actually going to pull up a square planar geometry so you can visualize it. There you go. So you see it's a it's in a square here. I don't know if I can read that. No, I can't. No. But there's a those are definite, uh, that's a definite square there, and you can see it. 90 degree bond angles and all of that. But the point being that if you've got the CLs 90 degrees from each other, it's a different compound from when they're 180 degrees from each other. So that is an example of positional or geometric isomerism. Optical isomerism. Now, optical isomerism can only occur in certain in certain instances, it can only occur when we've got a tetrahedral structure. And I'm going to show you here tetrahedral geometry as well. So you can visualize that. And 
that would be four objects attached to the central element. So there you go. If you've got four objects attached to the central element, this is what it looks like. So you'll see that this one points into the page, this one points out of the page, and we actually have a way of expressing that in pictures. And you can see that dash line there means it's going in and the wedge line means it's coming out. So looking at the structure here, the one I've got my cursor on would have the dash line and the one I've got my cursor on here would have the wedge line. These would just be regular lines because they're in the plane of the page. They're not going in or out of the page. Does anybody have any questions so far? Now the time when we can get optical isomerism is when we're dealing with a tetrahedral structure, but all four of these have to be different. And if all four are different, if what it means is that we can take a mirror image of the structure and this mirror image is actually going to be different from what we started with. And what makes it different is the fact that I can't now take this and line it up with the original structure. And because I can't line these two up, that means that they're different. I know it's very subtle, it's a very subtle kind of isomerism, but it, it does exist. The other time this can happen is when we're dealing with this EN ligand. So I'm just going to explain what EN is. EN is this ligand. Now it's called a bidentate ligand because it bonds twice. Here and here. So when we express the EN and it's attached to, to say a metal like CO, it kind of looks like this. And what I'm trying to say there is that the, the ends are here and here, and those are what are connecting to the, to the cobalt. But it always does so at a 90 degree angle. So you can see that here. When you've got a nickel here with three ENs on it, you can see that we can, ex we can express the EN3 structure, NIEN3, by showing us a an octahedral structure with these three fan-like ligands here because now the EN is, is bidentate. It also turns out that if we take a mirror image of that, that mirror image can't be lined up on the original either. So that is also a form of optical isomerism. To help you visualize this, I want to direct you to a video that I created that I strongly recommend that you watch to really understand the concept of optical isomerism. Let's see if I can find it here. Okay, and it's under structures and isomers here, this one. I'm just going to do, do the share again here. And then things attached to those metals. Now, when we're drawing out the formula for a coordination compound, everything we have a, in an arrangement like this, this is called a square atom. So in here, I go through and explain exactly why you need four different groups attached to a tetrahedral structure to get this to work. You'll find that if you've got two of the same, then you can't have this kind of isomerism occur. It has to be four different things attached to the tetrahedral structure. And then I also go through the EN structure here and show exactly why the mirror images 
don't line up when we've got three ENs connected to a central element. Uh, so I go through it on that video as well. That's a very, I think it's a very useful video to watch. It's only 11 minutes. I don't think I'm asking too much for people to view it. It really does give you a, a good deal of context and tells you exactly why optical isomerism forms different compounds. So when you're dealing with the isomerism, this would be what, what I would do first is I would kind of do a little flow chart and I would ask, um, are there negative, negatively charged ligands inside and outside? So that's the first thing. If the answer is yes, then you can do anion exchange. And you don't have to do any, anything else here. If the answer is no, then see, is it tetrahedral? with four different groups. Or octahedral with three ENs. If the answer is, uh, if the answer is yes, let's see if I can just use a little bit. If the answer is yes, then it's optical isomerism. If the answer is no, then you should be looking at positional isomerism. So I, I guess my, my point is positional is the last, is kind of like the last thing, the thing that's left over. You should look for these other things first and then assume that if you can't do either of the anion exchange nor the, nor the optical, then that's all that's left over is the, is the positional. Does anybody have any questions? All right, so that, that's how you should decide on the, on the summaries. Okay, now I think most of you are, well, you all should be aware of how we do um, electron configurations for something like anything in the, in the D block. And what, what I'm talking about here, uh, let, me, let me see, I have to pull up a, I think I should pull up a, periodic table here. Maybe I'll go to back to the back to the test here. So what we're talking about are these guys down here in the D block. And if I wanted to say, look at chromium, for example, if I wanted to figure out what the electron configuration was, it's gonna be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, and then for chromium, it'd be 1, 2, 3, 4, it'd be 3d4. Now, we, we don't usually 
express it like this, we'll take all of that and we'll turn it into argon. So it becomes AR4S2, 3D4. That's what it would be for chromium. Does anybody have any questions about the electron configurations here? Just a, a quick tip, see this number here, the one I've put the arrow on? It's always going to match whatever is next to the 20. So it could be five for MN, six for iron, et cetera, right? It's not that difficult. Okay, uh, any, any questions so far? Okay, uh, let's see what we're doing here. Now, when we're doing the, the D orbitals, the D orbitals themselves, there's five of them. So this is, this is just the 3D part. And if I was to do 3D4, the way I would do it would be to put four electrons in like this. And I have to put them in one at a time due to Bund's rule. I'm hoping you all remember that. So this would be just garden variety chromium. But the thing is when chromium forms these complexes or these coordinate compounds that we talk about, then what happens is this D, which is completely even here, will end up either having being split this way for octahedral having two on top and two on the bottom, or for tetrahedral having three on top and three on the bottom. So let me explain what's going on here. All of these D orbitals have these little designations, X squared minus Y squared, Z squared, XY, XZ, and YZ. And you can see that what the shapes of these orbitals are like. Now remember what orbitals are, they're just volumes in which we can find electrons, the spaces which we can find electrons. When we're dealing with an octahedral structure, we've got the metal in the middle here. And what that would mean is all six ligands are going to come along these X, Y, and Z axes in order to form the octahedral structure. You'll notice that for the X, Y, the X, Z, and the Y, Z orbitals, that the approach of these ligands is going to be in between the actual orbitals, which contain electrons. Now remember, ligands are negative as well. So when these don't interact, that's actually a lower energy situation than when the ligands are interacting directly with the lobes of these orbitals. So that's why we end up getting the splitting here with these three, the X, Y, the X, Z, and the Y, Z being on the bottom and the X squared minus Y squared and the Z squared being on the top. So what happens is this thing that was flat now becomes separated. We get what's called DD splitting between the two D sets of D orbitals. Does anybody have any questions so far? If it's a tetrahedral ligand, then what we want, what we imagine is that the four things that are coming in are going to be in between the X, Y, Z axes, which means that there's going to be more interaction with the ligands on the top, the XZ, the YZ, and the XZ, the XY, XZ, YZ, all of those are going to be higher energy than the X squared minus Y squared and the Z squared, where the ligands are not really interacting as much with the lobes. So you can see it's kind of flipped over for octahedral versus tetrahedral. Does anybody have any questions about this? So the other thing that we notice here is that depending on the kind of ligands we're dealing with, this is going to affect that distance between the D orbital levels, both on the octahedral and the tetrahedral. So when the ligand is, for example, H2O, what happens is we have a very small distance between the, between the two D orbital levels. And when it's something like CN, we have a very large distance. 
So we've got this list here. I think I do give this list to you in the, in the test so you don't have to memorize it. But what I will tell you is that the cutoff is pretty much here between the NH3 and the H2O. So the strong field ligands will be NH3 and above, and the weak field ones will be H2O and below. And that's going to determine then this distance between the two levels in the D, in the D, in the D shell that we talk about. Now the effect that this has, now if Fe3 plus, and I haven't gone through this yet, but Fe3 plus, I'm just going to tell you has five electrons. 5D electrons we have to deal with. So when we are dealing with an octahedral complex, and we know it's octahedral because we've got six things attached there, you can tell that. If this distance here is very small, then the way we put the electrons in it's just one at a time like this. We all, we treat, we kind of treat this like they're all on the same level. So delta is small. We just treat the electrons like they're on the same level. And delta will be small of its distance here between the DD, um, the DD levels will be small if we're dealing with a weak field ligand. So anything with H2O or OH minus F minus Cl minus Br minus. However, if we're dealing with a strong field, then this delta value is going to be large. And then we put the electrons in differently. So it'd be one, two, three, and then four and five. So you can see it has a big effect on how we, how we place those electrons. And this would have five unpaired electrons for the small. And it would have one unpaired electron for the large. So again, this distance that we're getting between the two sets of D orbitals or two levels of D orbitals is going to be determined by the ligands that we have attached to the central element. Strong field versus weak field with the cutoff being in between the NH3 and the H2O. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, so let's, let's go through some examples here and then I will we'll apply those examples to what you're going to see on the test as well. So this is the one we had looked at earlier, CONH35CNBR2. We draw the complex out and we have the two BRs on the outside and we draw it as an octahedral structure because there's six objects in between. Six objects on the, on the CO. Now, since it's octahedral, then the, the splitting is going to be The splitting is going to be with the two on top and the, and the three below. And the labeling is going to be like, as you see it here. The first thing we need to do is figure out how many D electrons we're dealing with, with cobalt. And to, to, for part of that, we're going to need to figure out what the, we're going to figure out what the charge on the cobalt is here as well. So I, I showed you this earlier, but I'll do it again over here. So cobalt plus five times zero plus one times negative one. All of that adds up to plus two. So what I was saying there is that this is everything in the square brackets. The NH3, sorry, up here, the NH3 has zero charge, the CN has a negative one charge. And I know that from my, my list up here. So the cobalt is going to be a three plus charge. So when we're doing the electron configuration, we figure out what would be for cobalt. And it would be AR, 4s2, 
Now let's see where's cobalt here. Three D seven because it's at twenty seven. I told you this last number here would match the atomic number, the last digit of the atomic number. Now, if we've got CO3 plus, that means it's CO minus three electrons. So three electrons need to be removed. And in a coordinate system, it turns out the 4S electrons are actually higher energy. So the 4S electrons go first. They're the first to go, which means that the CO3 plus electron configuration is going to be AR3D6. So we lose the two 4S electrons and then one of the D electrons. So this tells you how many D electrons we're actually dealing with. And if it is a if it is an octahedral system, then it's always what we have here, the d x squared minus y squared, dz squared, and then we've got uh, dxy, dxz, and dyz. And when we look at the, the ligands here and we take a look at them and we see we've got NH3s and CNs, and you'll see here that that would mean strong field because everything is, is at the strong field end, which means that this delta here, this difference is going to be large. Okay, I'll stop there for a second. Does anybody have any questions about how I'm determining whether this distance is going to be large or small? So we've got six electrons, so we put them in. We go one, two, three. Now we don't go up here because the distance is large. So we go four, five, six, which would indicate that there are zero one pair electrons. And that would be the answer for that one. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, another example here. So this, uh, we, we already did the, the isomers on this one. And if you remember my little flow chart from earlier, this one actually has a, a negative, negatively charged species on the inside and the outside. So we can do the anion exchange and that's the, that's what we came up with here. We already did that one earlier though. Okay, so here's another example. This one is a tetrahedral complex. And I know this because it's got the central, it's got the central element, the CR, and that's got four things attached to it, I, B, R, F, and C, L. So when I draw the complex, I draw it as a tetrahedral, which means I've got two in the same plane, and then I've got one pointing forward and one pointing out. It doesn't matter where any of these elements go. No particular order needs to be, needs to be placed here. You'll notice we end up with two Ks on the outside. They both have positive charges on them. So we know that we couldn't do anion exchange as a, as a possibility here for the isomer. But what we do have is a tetrahedral structure with four different things attached. And that's why we could come up with the mirror image. And that would be stereo or optical isomerism. So let's look at the, the DD splitting on this one. Now, the first thing would be to figure out what the charge on the chromium is. Now, if we know that, that there's two Ks on the outside here, and we know that B, R, C, L, I, and F are each negatively one charge. So that's for the four different ligands. And all of that adds up to be negative two. Now, the reason I know that is because we've got two K pluses here. 
which means everything in this everything in this square brackets must be a negative two charge. So I do a little bit of algebra here and chromium comes out to be plus two. Does anybody have any questions? How would you know the charges on these? We can go back and take a look at the, the ligand field list up here. All right, so the chromium comes out to be plus two. Now, if it was just regular chromium, it'd be AR. I'll take a look. It'd be AR4S23D4. So from CR2 plus, then it'd be AR. Remember the Four S electrons are the first to go. It'd be AR three D four. Now it's a tetrahedral system, so it's going to have the arrangement with the three on top. And we look at the ligands and you can see that they're all, you know, B, R, F, I, and C, L, you can see they're all weak field ligands. They're all down here. So what that means is that the distance between these two here is going to be fairly small. Which means that when we put the four electrons in, we treat them like they're all on the same level. So it'd be one, two, three and then four, which would mean there's four unpaired electrons for this one. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, I had a question real quick. Mm -hmm. What was uh, the reason for splitting those four electron pairs between the two D levels? Because the ligands are weak field ligands. So in the list up here, the weak field ones are to the right and strong field ones are to the left. You'll never see an instance where it'll be difficult to tell if they're strong or weak field by combination. They're always going to be the same thing. No, yeah, I understand that. I was just wondering why you didn't put one in the D, Y, Z, and you went straight to the D. Oh, well, one. it wouldn't matter. Did you just need to put, well, you could you could put these two in any of these up here. Okay, cool. Necessarily. What's more important is that there's four unpaired electrons. Okay. That's, that's just all that really matters there. So when it's weak, like delta is small, and that's why we put the four separate ones. No, you treat it all. You treat it like it's all on the same level, Gabriella. Like you okay. would if, if it was all flat. Okay. Because, because that's so small, and you'll know it's small only because of the ligands that are attached. And then the example we did before, it was large because it was strong. Yeah, strong field because it was okay. NH threes and CN. And okay. Look, see how they're on the in the strong field side, yeah. and all these other ones are on the weak field side. Yes, got it. Okay. All right. So I've got four more examples down here as well. This first one here, the K2COCl4H2O2. So this is a an octahedral complex where you've got four Cls and two H2Os. You'll have the two Ks on the outside as well. You'll notice that we can set this up one of two ways. We can have the waters 180 degrees or we can have the waters at 90 degrees. So this is an example of positional isomerism. We couldn't do, we couldn't do anion exchange because we don't have any anions on the outside. And it didn't, it couldn't be optical because it's not tetrahedral with four different groups or has ENs on it. So the only thing left over that we could possibly do was this positional thing. It's kind of subtle though, and it's all about the angles between the waters here. So if 180 degrees versus 90 is actually going to be a different kind of uh, isomer. As I said, 
on the real test, you know, I can't really test this. I can't test you drawing them. So it makes it a little bit easier. All I can ask you is the kinds of the kinds of isomerism that are going to be possible. And I'll get to that in a minute. So for this one, when we're talking about the number of electrons, the first thing we've got to do is figure out how many electrons we're actually dealing with. And we need to, first of all, figure out the charge on the cobalt here. So the, uh, the, co the, the cobalt plus, let's see, it's going to be four times negative one for the CLs plus two times zero for the water. And all of that adds up to two minus or negative two. Because if you've got two Ks on the outside, that means everything in the square brackets must be negative two. So the cobalt is going to have to be plus two in order to make that work. Now cobalt is going to be AR4S2 3D7. And again, here it is 27. So cobalt two plus is going to be AR, remember the 4S electrons are the first to go, so it's AR3D7. And we've got seven electrons to put in because of that. And since it's octahedral, then we've got the situation where we've got two on top and three on the bottom. And that would be x squared minus y squared, z squared, dxy, and dxz, dyz. And then, you know, we've got the seven electrons we need to put in, but we need to figure out if this delta is going to be small or large. If you look at the ligands, we've got combinations of chloride, Cl minus NH2O. And if we look at the, the list here, you can see that's all weak field stuff that we're talking about down here, which means this delta value is going to be small, which means that the electrons go in one at a time first, one, two, three, four, five, and then the other two go down the bottom here, six and seven. So that would be three unpaired electrons. All right, does anybody have any questions? I did have a quick question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, go over really quick how you do like the 4s2 3d7 like how you got that that first part yeah like i think i got it i just want to make sure i'm uh, okay so it's one at 1s2 2s2 2p6 3s2 3p6 then right. we come down here this is 4s2 down here with the calcium right. and the potassium and then it's just one two three four five six seven Okay. So the, the D always matches its second digit here, Gabrielle. Okay. Okay. I understand that. And that's so what if, I, I just wanted to make sure. If it was MN, it'd just be five. Five. If it was okay. FE, it'd be six. Copper, it'd be nine. Gotcha. So it matched that second digit. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I think that makes it pretty easy. And the, other, the only other thing in it you have to understand then is that when you, you're taking electrons away, the four S electrons are always the first to go. Right. And then you can determine the distance, the delta distance between the two levels by looking at the ligands. Okay. Okay. Let's take a look at the at the questions you, you'll see on the test here. It's just to do a coordination chemistry here. Now that we've done some examples, you can you can get on get an idea. I think what I'm, I'm going to have to do here, and I, I haven't done this, and uh, it kind of surprises me I haven't actually, is I'm going to have to include, I think, some diagrams here of what octahedral and tetrahedral look like so that you don't, you don't have to memorize what those look like. Uh, and also, the other thing I should do here is give you that, that strong field, weak field list that needs to be in here as well. I'm, I'm kind of surprised I haven't got that here, but I will include that. I'm going to add that. I'll add that today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 
So, oh, yeah. so what am I, what am I going to add? Well, let me, let me, let me tell you what I'm going to add here. I don't know why I didn't. No, I don't know. I can't, I can't give you an idea of why I haven't, haven't had this in the past. All right. So here's what I'm going to have you. Here's what I'm going to have for you. This will be given because I'm going to add this in. And I'll write octahedral here. Now that's going to have six six objects, always. That's how, that's how you'll know. And then the the other thing I'll give you. Actually, I won't. Actually, that that won't be given to you. I'm not going to tell you what six objects. That's, uh, I'm not going to tell you that, but you, you have to, you'll have to know that. The other thing I'll give you is, of course, this one here, the tetrahedral. This will be, this will be actually in the test, right? And it's all about tweaking, you know, and making sure that everybody has what they need. You don't have to memorize a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so that's the Delby tetrahedral. I'll give you that. The other thing I'll, I will give you is the list here. You know, CN, CN minus is better than, I, to, I can't remember it exactly. Let's see, here we go. I'll give it as one straight line though. I just ran out of space here. So I'll give you that as well, going from strong, strong to weak. What you would have to know though, is that the cutoff here is, there's a cutoff right here where I've got the cursor. Let's go back to the go back to the initial problem. I think that's that's all you would really need. So if you've got M A B C D B R two and you're looking for the this is the charge on the metal M. See, it's got the ligand charges here. So you know that everything. If you've got two BRs on the outside, everything in the square bracket adds up to plus two. So it would be M plus. Let's see, A is negative one. B is negative one, C is negative one, D is zero. And all of that adds up to positive two. Then you could do the math here and I guess M would end up being five, right? Or plus five. I think it's just expected to put the number in there. All right, any questions about something like that? Is it do the same thing with this one? Uh, metal has an atomic number of 27, its charge is plus two. How many D electrons does this possess? So, what you'll do is you can look at the periodic table. Figure out what 27 is. Here are tables up here. That's cobalt. The questions aren't, aren't really difficult here for this. So it would be AR4S2 3D7. So Gabriella, this is kind of what you were talking about earlier. And then if it's two plus, that means we lose these and it becomes 3D seven. So the answer would be seven. Okay. 
28, what kind of isomerism? And, you know, I, I go through these anion exchange geometric or stereochemistry. And you can see here that this would be, you need, you need to look at this and see how many, how many things there are and determine if it's octahedral or tetrahedral. Can anybody tell me on this one, whether it's octahedral or tetrahedral? MA4B2, what's that? Octahedral. Why do you say that, Kyle? Because uh, I see six species attached to the metal. Yeah, so you've got four A's and two B's. So you just count the things there. If there's four things, it's tetrahedral. If it's six, it's octahedral. Yeah. And then from that, you, you look, you can see, is there an anion on the outside? No, it can't be anion exchange. So you'd, you'd end up probably going with geometric on that one. And in these kinds of questions, I tell you if it's a, the weak field or the, I actually tell you if it's weak field or strong field. So <laughs> there's no, you don't even have to figure anything out. You don't even really need this list, I guess. <laughs> but I think it would be helpful to have these two diagrams for this question. So I, I will include these with the test, definitely. I'll probably end up including the strong and weak field list, but really, I mean, <laughs> you don't even need it. I uh, say so for this one, for octahedral, and it has four electrons. And then you have to figure out, well, if it's, is it, is it weak or strong? I actually tell you if it's weak or strong. And if it was, if it's weak, that would mean that it would go one, two, three, four. Actually, I'll put them in. One, two, three, four. So that would be, that would be four uh, unpaired electrons. So, and it kind of makes it makes it pretty easy. Yeah, I'm kind of limited with this in what I can do. So, so for that question, it would just be four because yeah. it's weak. Okay. Yeah, that's right. And for this one, here's another one, tetrahedral weak field, and it's got seven electrons. So you use the, the other set here. I mean, you'll, you'll have these two diagrams, I'll, I'll include them both. And seven electrons, you have to go, it says weak field. So again, we go one, two, and we have to do three, four, five, and then we go six and seven. So that would be three unpaired electrons would be the answer for that one. So it doesn't make it too difficult. I mean, this is so much easier than what people had to do on a pen and paper test. So I was kind of limited by what I could ask, especially from a geometric standpoint. So that's what you'll do. For Does anybody have any questions, Gabrielle? Um, for that last one, if it mm -hmm. would have been a strong field with seven electrons, would it have just been then one unpaired? Um, actually, if it was if it was a strong field, I think it would have ended up being the same, Gabriella. Now you would have put the you would have put the electrons in differently. You would have gone one, right. two, three, four, and then it goes five, six, seven. So it would be the same. Oh, it would be the same. Okay. In that, in that, it's, it's not always the same, right? Okay. But, but in this instance, I think it could, it would be. Okay. Good question, though. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Well, we'll leave it there for today then. Thanks for thanks for coming, and I'll see you all on on Tuesday. Okay, more well, hey, have least, a good weekend. I'll see some people on Tuesday. I hope. <laughs> all right, you too. Kyle, bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Alex, do you need anything?